Okay. I will be reading the scriptures for the message this morning. Um, If you got the film blast last night, you know what it was. So it is Luke chapter 17, verse 26. I'm going to roll right into chapter 18 through verse 8. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV translation. Just as it was written in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On the day that no one who was on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in bed. One will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's quite a passage of scripture, isn't it? Uh, In that passage of scripture, Jesus is warning us of the conditions that will take place uh, prior to his coming. And if you read that whole passage of scripture, the Lord is warning us that there'll be unprecedented evil and godlessness and unrighteousness. And I think that world conditions, the evil and sin that we're seeing now It's only going to intensify. I think of even in our own nation, uh, it seems that, I I don't know, it seems that the unrighteousness and evil that we're seeing is almost being more and more accepted uh, by the people. And And reading this, one of the things that came to mind was, if we think things are bad now, they're going to get much worse. And we need to be spiritually prepared and spiritually fortified. And I think the parable of the unjust judge and the widow is a reminder to us that we need to be prayed up. And we need to be ready and stay ready for the Lord's return. Now, one of the things we know for sure that the Lord's coming back. And Jesus, in trying to prepare us for the evil of the last days, He uses two examples. He uses the example of Lot, which ties in with Sodom and Gomorrah, and he uses the uh, example of of Noah. And what the Lord is trying to say to us, if we think back at the Old Testament and look at what was taking place with Sodom and Gomorrah and in the days of Noah, that that's the way our society will look like. In other words, there will be unprecedented evil and unrighteousness. And I think one of the themes here is the Lord is trying to tell us to prepare ourselves for that. Uh, In Genesis 6, the whole world was absorbed in wickedness and immorality and and evil. And as we read the story back there in Genesis 6, we see that the people rejected God. They spurned God. They spurned the commandments of God. And they continued All their normal events of daily life, eating, drinking, and marrying, 
and yet immorality and sin and evil was their part of their daily routine. It was an ongoing lifestyle, and the Lord was extremely upset at that. And also, God warned Lot to flee Sodom and Gomorrah. Many of you know what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God told Lot, I am going to judge those twin cities. And God did. Fortunately, Lot obeyed, and uh, God sent fire and brimstone to Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot listened, and, and Lot obeyed. God also commissioned Noah to preach to his neighbors to build an ark. God once again said he was going to judge the world. He was going to judge the world for the immorality, for the corruption. And you know what God did? Uh, Noah built the ark, and the Bible says that God shut them in. So uh, there was ample warning of judgment, but unfortunately there was little response. And by the way, uh, Lot and Noah, if you study their lives, they were imperfect people. You know, it's, it's interesting that Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And by the way, the word perfect there is like whole or complete. Uh, none of us will ever reach sinless perfection. So if you study Lot and Noah, the reason that they escaped, not because they were perfect, but they listened to God. And that's really, really important as Christians that we listen. Lot and, and, and Noah, they knew judgment was coming. It was imminent. And they obeyed and they avoided judgment. And again, one of the lessons we need to learn is we need to obey God and obey his word. You know, there are over 300 references concerning the rapture and the second coming. And Jesus explained there will be two women. One will be left behind. The other one will be taken. So we need to prepare ourselves. We believe in the imminency of Christ's return. The idea that, hey, the Lord can return at any time, and we need to be ready. Matthew 24, 44 says, Be ye therefore uh, ready in such an hour that you think not that the Son of Man <laughs> will come. So we don't want to be spiritually lukewarm as we prepare for the Lord's coming. Uh, Jesus tells us a parable in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins. Uh, you get a chance, read it this week. <clears throat> the Bible says five had oil and five didn't have oil. And we know the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And in that parable, the Lord is trying to tell us that we need to be ready, that we need to be prepared, that we must maintain our spiritual fervency, our spiritual passion. And so this is really important. And the reason that God was so upset with Lot and Noah's generation is they accepted the wickedness as normal. The public wasn't alarmed at all the wickedness and the unrighteousness that was occurring. They, in a sense, they condoned it. They approved it. And Jesus said they lived their lives with wickedness all around them, and it didn't bother anybody. And Jesus said they kept eating and drinking and marrying. Uh, he said it twice. In other words, they went on their daily routine, and all the wickedness around them didn't bother them at all. The idea that we need to be sensitive to sin and evil. And we need to pray that, Lord, help us as we deal with things like that. And, you know, in the book of Corinthians, uh, chapter 5, the Bible says there was a man that was sleeping with his stepmother. And one of the reasons the apostle Paul was upset that nobody in the church said anything. Pretty much the church condoned it. They just went on, oh, it's okay. And Paul was very, very upset, not just at the sin that the guy was sleeping with his stepmother. He was upset at the church, like, hey, guys, shouldn't you be responsible to say something or do something? Matter of fact, you know what Paul said? You need to kick the guy out. Kick him out, turn him over to the devil, let the devil lump him up so he can come back and be restored. By the way, one of the beautiful things about 2 Corinthians, Paul mentions that guy, and Paul wanted to be sure that that man was restored. And that's always our goal. If somebody falls into sin, our goal is to restore, right? Galatians 6.1, If any man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, you restore that person. So it is always our goal. But Paul was upset 
Nobody was saying anything. And I think the danger that you and I face is that when lawlessness and corruption and immorality is around us that we just say, we just condone it. We just accept it. And let's be honest, lawlessness and evil, it's gaining national acceptance in our nation. It's almost like it's normal. You know, uh, first we overlook sin, then we permit sin, then we legalize evil, then we promote it, then we applaud it. And, you know, years ago, some, some things were embarrassing. Now, they want us to celebrate and, and applaud them for that, you know. Uh, sometimes if we say that it's wrong, uh, we're labeled as intolerant, we're labeled as, as judgmental, we really need revival. Sometimes I think our nation, we're on a collision course with God's judgment. We need the Lord to awaken us and to do a new work in our hearts and in our lives, Right? Yeah, and you know what Jesus said when talking about his second coming? It's like he drops a bombshell right in the middle of his teaching, and he says, remember Lot's wife. Do we know the story about Lot's wife? She gambled with her eternal soul. You know, she spurned her spiritual privileges. She was warned, listen, you've got to flee the city. Judgment is coming. She didn't do it. And she suffered the consequence. You know, thinking about Lot's wife, she probably said, God is love. God won't do that. Well, friends, you know, there's a lot of benefits to Christianity, but there is responsibilities to Christianity. You know, the Bible says uh, a false balance is an abomination. We need to keep things in balance. And if we're warned in Scripture, if our Lord warns us, as Christians, we need to take heed to those things. Are you with me? You know, and unfortunately, she perished. By the way, the Bible says God is love. The Bible also says God is a consuming fire. I want to tell you, friends, it's a healthy thing to fear God. And what I mean by that is we've reverenced God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, don't fear them that can kill the body. You know, don't fear your enemy that may shoot you or stab you. Jesus said, but fear him who can kill you and cast you into hell. The idea that we need to reverence God. And when God's word is speaking to our hearts, we need, we need, we need to listen. And unfortunately, Jesus said here, remember her. Remember Lot's wife. I want to tell you, Lot's wife knew the will of God. Can I say it again? She knew the will of God, but she rejected it. And unfortunately, uh, she perished. What am I saying? We need to obey God. By the way, verse 37, Jesus quotes a very familiar Proverbs. Just as the gathering of vultures shows that there is a carcass nearby, so these signs show that the end is near, that the second coming is near. One, vert, one vulture, excuse me, circling overhead doesn't mean much. But when you get 10 vultures, when you get 20 vultures, something is going on. There's a carcass there. Jesus is saying, Listen, there are signs all around you. And when you see the signs, I'm coming back. By the way, if you're interested about the Lord's return, read the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 25. We need to be ready and stay ready. Now, Jesus links the events of the last days with prayer. In chapter 18, we're moving on to chapter 18. We are to pray at all times and not lose heart. By the way, there's no division in chapters when it was written. So it's not like, oh, we just ended chapter 17. Forget about all that. No, no, no. It's one continuous teaching. The Lord is saying, I'm coming back. And one of the things he's exhorting us is that we need to persevere in prayer. Jesus, by the way, is speaking to the disciples. If you read this whole context, you know, we are to pray at all times. He's speaking to you and I. Sometimes... Jesus speaks to the multitude, to the unsaved. Jesus is speaking to us, and he's trying to tell us about being prepared and praying not to get sidetracked, you know, not to be discouraged. Prayer will keep us spiritually strong. It will keep us vibrant in the last days, and it's our decision. We need to pray. Prayer keeps our faith vital and active and energized. Prayer is the catalyst for change and growth and fruitfulness and steadfastness. 
Friends, if you want to grow, spend more time with the Lord. Closeness is likeness. And by the way, you know, I believe everything our Lord teaches, he models for us. It's not like he says, I want you to do this, but he doesn't do it. You know, Jesus models for us. In Matthew 14, it says, Jesus sent the crowd away, and he went on top of the mountain by himself to pray. What an example. In his humanness, we know Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. But in his humanness, he's modeling for us. Much like God says to rest on the seventh day. God didn't need the rest. He's trying to teach us something. So Jesus is our example. By the way, John Wesley said this, God does nothing except an answer to prayer. That's good, isn't it? One of the privileges that we have is prayer. We can't all be missionaries or preach or teach, but what a privilege, the privilege of prayer. And Paul says to pray without ceasing. The idea of always being in an attitude of prayer. I want to tell you, you could be driving and be in an attitude of prayer. That you're just sensitive to the Lord. You're speaking to the Lord. While you're fully cognizant of what's going on, the green lights, the red lights, you can be in that attitude, the attitude of prayer. I use the term being prayed up. You know, it's a wonderful thing. We can be, we can be prayed up. Jesus never taught the disciples to preach uh, or teach, but he taught them to pray. Thomas Watson said, prayer delights God's air and it melts his heart. One of the most prominent teachings of Scripture is that God wants us to pray. The idea of making prayer a, a daily routine, a daily experience, it's a means of us expressing our devotion, our dependence, our faith in God. God honors faith. Faith honors God. Amen. Bible says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. We could pray about those little things in our lives. God hears. God answers. You know what's interesting? We charge our iPhones and our iPads every night, right? To recharge them, we need to be recharged spiritually. And how do we recharge? Prayer. We spend that time with prayer. Friends, you say, you say oh, Tony, I'm too busy. Friends, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy, right? We can approach the very throne room of, of grace in our time of need. In prayer, we're reminded God is in control. We know all things work together for good. There's a silver lining. Prayer is like a spiritual tonic for us. Amen. It keeps us strong. Now, in our text, Jesus, again, speaking this parable in Luke chapter 18 to the disciples. He's speaking this parable to us. Now, there are two people in the parable, the judge and the widow. The judge is a godless man. He's a wicked man. He's an atheist. Socially, this guy is calloused. He could care about nobody. He's indifferent. He's uncaring. And then we have the widow. Now, Jesus using the widow is significant. She's a symbol of weakness. She's a symbol of hopelessness. Friends, there were no jobs in the first century for widows. There were barely jobs for men that could do manual labor. There wasn't much industry in Israel during that time. So a widow, basically, she was weak. She was helpless. There were no government programs to assist them. Widows possessed no social significance or status. Thank God in our nation, with our economy, everybody can get a job. I mean, you look in almost every store, there's help wanted, right? Uh, I, uh, Cheryl Greco, Sister Greco, she lost her husband. She's got two jobs. So, uh, but the widow, she has no legal uh, uh, status here. And obviously, she's got a, a legal problem. She's got a legal issue. There's probably a financial dispute. Perhaps there's a lawsuit against her. There's no advocate. There's nobody there to help her. So she seeks justice and mercy from the judge. The judge, he's callous. He doesn't care about her. He's completely jaded. He doesn't want to be bothered with her. But Jesus said, this widow, she persisted. She persisted. She probably went to the courthouse every day. And if his name was Harry, hey, Judge Harry, don't forget about me. Every day she must have bugged this guy, right? Uh, and finally, Jesus in the parable he tells us the judge granted her request and ruled in her favor. 
why she persisted. One of the things that our Lord is trying to tell us here is persevering prayer. It stirs the heart of God. And, but there's a larger lesson here, and we can't miss this. Prayer will fortify us and sustain this in the last days. We need to be prayed up in the last days. You know, how often we feel like this woman. We're facing an adversary. We got a problem. We're in a jam. It's a family jam. It's a job or, or marriage or children or money. I want to remind us, faith is the victory. Amen. We need to persevere and trust God. God will make a way for us. Amen. God is our protection. God is our advocate. In the book of Habakkuk, it says, Though the fig tree does not end, uh, 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 does not bud, excuse me, there's no grapes, there's no vines, no sheep. The idea there was a drought. Read it in, in Habakkuk. And the prophet said, Yet despite these terrible conditions, I'm going to trust the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. How can the prophet say that? He knew the character of God. Amen. God can be trusted. God will not forsake his own. I, I need to move on. Uh, you know, friends, one of the greatest devotional statements, if not the greatest devotional statement in the Bible, is found in the book of Job, where Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Doesn't matter what happens. I may not understand it. I may not like it. And Job lost his family. He lost his money. And yet Job said, you know what? I'm going to trust him. Amen. Amen. I got to skip a little bit. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, hallelujah, the Lord said, I'm going to be with you. The Lord never said we're not going to go through trials, right? When you go through the rivers, I'm going to be with you. When you go through the fire, are you with me? Come on now. We're going to face issues. We're going to face problems. The Lord will be with us. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 46, King Cyrus, the Persian, they, they invaded ba the Babylon. And you know what happened? The Babylonians, they were fearful of the Persians. And they gathered all their gods and they put them in baskets, and they took their gods with them. They had to carry their gods. How unlike us, when we have a problem, God carries us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's always there to carry us through. He will see us through. He will make a way where there is no way. Hallelujah. We can trust him. Amen. Let's not panic. Let's not go AWOL. The Lord will see us through. The Lord gave me a, a verse. Lamentations 3.24 the Lord is my portion, says my soul. I will hope in him. Amen. That's Jeremiah's testimony. Do you know what Jeremiah went through? Unprecedented. The adversity. And this was his testimony. Lord, it begins with the Lord. Our success begins with God. He's divine. We're the branches. Friends, without him, we're nothing. The greater our attachment, the greater our strength. Amen. Amen. We need, it begins with him. The Lord is present today, right now. David says, the Lord is right now as my shepherd. Today, right now. It's personal. And, and Jeremiah said, he's my portion. By the way, the word portion means inheritance or allotment. Friends, when we develop a relationship with Christ, not merely going to church, a relationship, he becomes our peace. He becomes our strength. He becomes our righteousness. He becomes our joy. He becomes our victory. Amen. He's our teacher. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our priest. He's our advocate. And he's our soon coming king. Amen. And Jeremiah says, I will hope in him. Amen. Faith is a choice. Oh, friends, the Lord is our portion. The Lord is our inheritance. Quickly. Friends, this parable, you can't miss this. This parable is a parable of contrast. The contrast is between the wicked judge and the character of God. It is a contrast between the judge, how wicked, and God. Jesus said, if the wicked judge can respond and be merciful 
and execute justice, how much more will your heavenly Father demonstrate his mercy to you? Amen. Did you get it? If this ungodly, callous, wicked judge, if he found it in his heart to minister to this widow, Jesus is saying, how much more will your heavenly Father minister to you? Amen. And grant you mercy. Are you with me? And grant you grace. Amen. The parable is emphasizing the graciousness of God, the mercy of God, the concern of God. And by the way, what distinguishes this woman, again, is her tenacity, her perseverance. There's a lot of things our Lord is trying to teach us here, not only about the character of God, that God's character is far, far greater than this judge, but he's trying to teach us we need to persevere in the last days. When we understand and realize, friends, I want to tell you, friends, things are going to get worse. You say, oh, Tony, there's so much wickedness in our nation. There's so much corruption. I completely agree it's going to get worse. Listen, by the way, there's a verse here that I often wondered what it meant, and I studied a little bit more. Jesus ends this parable now, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to me, to the disciples. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Could you just imagine that? Will he find faith? You know, will we have this woman's tenacity? Are we going to persevere? There are over 2 billion Christians worldwide. Will they persevere? Will you and I persevere? The Lord is encouraging us. Do you know what, friends? The Bible warns us. Much like our Lord is warning us here, the Bible warns us, Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, 11, that in the last days there's going to be a falling away. People are going to be deceived with false teaching, false doctrine. And, and the sequence of chapter 17 and 18, despite the events, the circumstances of the last days, prayer is the force, the power, amen, that will energize us, amen, empower us and keep us. Prayer will keep our faith active. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Three quick lessons. I got, I got one minute. <laughs> Number one, despite world conditions around us, we need to persevere in faith and prayer. Friends, you know, I'm not a doomster. You know, the sky's falling. But I want to tell you, according to this, it's going to get worse. We need to stay ready. We need to be ready. Lesson number two, only God can bring about justice in a corrupt world. God will produce miraculous justice for us. What happened to this widow will happen to us. The Lord will help us. Lesson number three in chapter 18, verse 7. Listen to what Jesus said. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen one, you and I, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep, keep putting them off? Absolutely not, friends. The Lord is going to be our advocate. He's going to be our champion. He will be the unseen miracle worker for us in the last days. He will vindicate us. And everybody said, Amen. I close with this challenge. I want to challenge all of us to develop a daily time of prayer where we're by ourselves, just like the Lord modeled for us. In the morning, ideally it's in the morning. And you know what, friends? I'm not telling you you've got to pray for an hour. How about starting with two minutes and then develop into three minutes and then the four minutes and then the five minutes? I encourage all of us. And as you're praying, read the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, my challenge is couples. I challenge you to begin praying together. It's amazing how we can watch a two-hour movie together, but we can't spend time praying together. Thank you, Maria. Seriously, guys, I challenge you to do that. It will strengthen your faith. It will strengthen your, it will strengthen your marriage. My third challenge is to dads. I want to challenge you, dad, to have family devotions with your family to have family altar, maybe one night or two nights a week. Shut the television off, gather together. Share your testimony with the kids, 
what God has done in your heart and your life. Take prayer requests. Read scripture. Have family time. Altar time together. It'll pay great, great, great dividends. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand together. We'll close. You can be dismissed. Members, if you can hang out, Pastor Kurt uh, is with us today. Lord, thank you so much for your word, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for reminding us you are coming back, Lord, and we need to be prepared. Amen. Lord, help us to be prepared. Help us to spend that quiet time with you, with our spouses and with our families and our children. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great, great day in Jesus' name.